Amen. Thank the Lord for another time. Amen. Thank the Lord also for the Bible studies. Amen. John, in his prophecy of the end time, in his narration of the vision that he saw, speaking of Jesus, he said, He that testified these things says, I come quickly. Jesus said, He cometh quickly. Because the Bible says that a thousand years is like a day unto God, like Peter said. A thousand years. If you are a God who is ancient of days, you don't live in time, you create a time. So to him, that thousand years that man may think that is so much, compared to the ageless past, is one day to him. It's one day to him. So when he said he was coming quickly, he was coming quickly. It doesn't mean that God didn't know, doesn't know time. He doesn't know the measurement of time. He measures time. But time compared to eternity is nothing. No matter the years. There are Christians that when you talk of them, to them that you have to do much for God, do much for Jesus, some will tell you that I just want to make heaven. I just want to make it to the kingdom. He says, just being the kingdom is enough for me. The day you receive that new body, it will be so with you. As long as you are in this body, you will think like that. Because like Paul said, the flesh war against the spirit. They are contrary. The flesh is in opposition to the spirit. And because of the flesh, like he said to the Galatians Christians, says that because of the oppositions of the flesh, the spirit cannot do what it wants to do. So as long as you allow the things of the flesh to set in, you will see spiritual things as very likely. But these are important things. Because when God created man, what was God's plan? What was God's mind concerning creating a body for man? Before the fall set in, before there was a fall, before sin came into the flesh, man's body was supposed to reveal and reveal only his spirit. So with that sin, man, the body was just a slave going to reveal the emotions of the spirit. And in the spirit of every human being, not even Christians, there is this yearning for his maker. There is this yearning for spiritual things, for spiritual verities, for spiritual truths. That's all what the spirit knows. The spirit doesn't know entertainment. The spirit doesn't know television. The spirit doesn't know that these are things, the pleasures of this world. All what the spirit, this pleasure to the spirit, are the things of God. But things change when sin set in. And because of that now, the flesh now has its own lust and pleasures which are contrary to the spirit. The day a man dies and a spirit comes out of his body, it doesn't become the same. They are all believers who think that they don't care anything about God. Uh, there are some who say, oh, we don't care anything about God and his message. It's not the same when you come out of your body. When a man dies and the spirit comes out of your body, then reality will down on you that you are messing up your life. It's not the same. In the same way, when a Christian, you come out of your body and you didn't do much for the Lord, you will not be happy. There was a man of God many years ago by the name Howard, Pastor Howard. He was a pastor, he was a Christian, but he was not doing things really according to God's plan and God's purpose. And he died. 
when he died, like Paul said, your wife should be burned, but you'll be saved. So he was saved. He got really to heaven. But in heaven, he met the Lord. And the Lord showed him all how he lived. And everything was burned in front of him. But fortunately for him, he had the chance to return back to life. When he came back to life, he sold everything that he had and went on preaching the gospel. Went on winning souls. As Christians, not let, don't let us assume that once the trumpet sounds and you receive that new body, which will bring the spirit so much into life. You see, when Christians are filled with the spirit, all they think about is about spiritual things. When you are even this, when you are full of the spirit, all what you think about, like Paul says, the love of Christ constrained me. But when you receive the new body, it will be that consistently. So your yearning for spiritual things will come so much to life, and that is when a Christian will realize that I was living anyhow. We realize that he made a big mistake. And made a big mistake. But those, because the word of God reveals what your spirit really is feeling, the emotions of your spirit. Every Christian, the word of God just reveals the emotions of your spirit. But that can be submerged by the soul. What has flooded your soul? If the things of the spirit is not what have flooded your soul then you will not have these emotions. But once you allow your soul to be renewed with the spirit, then you have these emotions of the spirit in the soul. You have these emotions of the spirit in the soul. Now, God has measured time. God has measured time from the beginning to the end of the time dimension. There is a dimension which is timeless. And that timeless dimension only will come in after the millennium. So from the creation to the end of the millennium is the time dimension. That is when there is time. That is when God's creation lives in time. And God already has measured that time from creation to the millennium. To bring his purpose and his plan to be. And this time, so when you read Acts chapter 17, when you read Acts chapter 17, the Bible let us know that there are times and seasons in God's plan. There are times for everything. And things will only come to pass in God's appointed time only come to pass in God's appointed time. He has appointed times for everything. So when you read Acts chapter 17 from verse 24, Paul says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything seen, he gave to all life and breath and all things, and had made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on the face of the earth. And he goes on to say that God has determined the times before appointed. These nations, he determined their times. And that is why he can come to show to Nebuchadnezzar, after you, this empire will come. The empire of the Medes and the Persians, it will come. Then even after them, this empire will come. And goes on to tell even Nebuchadnezzar what will proceed at the end, at the latter time. Why? 
Because God had appointed a time for all these nations. So Paul here says that and had made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and had determined the times before appointed. So these things is not something strange to God. God knows what is coming. He, now he knows the time that the world is in. He knows our time. And this time, what does he plan? What does he purpose? He knows it. What is coming after this time too? He knows it. God has appointed all the times. Not only that, he says, even the bounds of their habitation. Why is Ghana having this boundary? Why are the Iran having a, this boundary, a territory? It's because God planned it that way. So even how they have been placed, their locations, their territories, it was planned by God. So everything is about God's bigger plan. He has a bigger plan of revealing himself and also his plan of redemption. There is a bigger plan from the beginning to the end. And in this time plan, the time dimension, there are ages. There have been ages before us. Now we are in the age of the church. But before the age of the church, we had the age of the Gentiles. We have the age of the Israelites. Now, majorly in God's timetable, God's calendar, we are in the age of the church. Then after, the age of the Lord too will come. So God has all these times appointed and planned. So if you are a Christian, you think that God is now thinking when Jesus will come, you are deceiving yourself. God is not now thinking when Jesus will come. Like last week as you read from Acts chapter 1, when the Lord was speaking. Before even Jesus came the first time, the, his first coming, before even he came, God knew when in time Jesus was supposed to come in his second coming. He knows everything. He knows when he was supposed to come in the second coming. And that's why Isaiah will tell us that God has planned the end from the beginning. So it's not that after Jesus came the first time, then now God was going to plan. When will you come again the second time? No, he knows the second coming. He knew the first coming. So Jesus just came to fulfill prophecy. So when we read Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4 says that in the fullness of time, he came to fulfill that prophecy of what? Going to the cross to die and pay for man's sins. In the same time, there will be a fullness of time coming very soon when he comes to execute judgment on the earth. And that is what we call it the second coming. The second coming, he is coming to execute judgment on his enemies. And it is at that same coming that the church and also the remnant of Israel get to be vindicated from the these enemies, they'll get the arrest from all the tribulations. But there are Christians who think that they will be raptured before that time. And why is this so important that always I keep on repeating? Because it's very important. It's very important for the church to understand that they will be here in the tribulation. Because you deceive yourself thinking you'll be raptured before the tribulation. All those teachings that they have been teaching majorly by ministers in U.S. and also some well-known ministers in Africa that the church, they are going to be raptured before the tribulation. It's not scriptural. It's not true. The church will be here. What has led to that is because of pride of the Gentile church. Which Paul talks about in Romans chapter 11, the pride, the pride of the Gentile church. When we get, we forsake the understanding the truth that God's plan is started with one nation. That nation was the nation of Israel. God started his plan of redemption with the, a nation called Israel. And it's with this nation that will bring the Gentile and all other nations in. So when you read Acts chapter 3, when you read Acts chapter 3,
what Peter said in Acts chapter 3 to the Jews. When you read Acts chapter 3 from verse 25, Peter talking to the Jews, he said, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers. Say unto Abraham, Say unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. So in Genesis chapter 12, when God was speaking to Abraham, he said, In thy seed shall all the kindreds, not some, all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. All the kindreds of the earth will be blessed in that seed called the Christ. But then he goes on in the next verse to say that unto you first, even though God's plan was to bless all the kindreds, all the nations of this earth in his seed, the Christ. He started that plan with the Jews. So he says, unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. So it was first to the Jews, in turn away every one of you from his iniquities. So the plan started with the Jews, like Jesus himself said, that salvation is of the Jews. And with that plan that he started with the Jews, now he brings in the Gentile nations. Now when the Gentiles got converted because of the disobedience of the Jews, now they come presenting themselves that they are unique from the Jewish Israelites. That they are unique, that they are special, that the plan, God's major plan is about them. And now the Israelites are secondary to God. This is pride and high-mindedness. And that is why Paul admonished the Gentile church to stop that pride and know that it is not about them, it's about the Israelite nation. When God said, I'm going to make a new covenant, he didn't say that this new covenant is with assemblies of God. He didn't say that this new covenant is with light embassy. He didn't say that new, this new covenant is with Christ's embassy. He didn't say that this new covenant is with lighthouse. He didn't say it's with the Roman Catholic Church or Presbyterian or Pentecost. He said it's with what? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. So God says that this new covenant is about the nation of Israel. And now if you are a Gentile and you believe in Christ, you are brought into that tree called the Israelite, that tree. And that is why in Galatians, Paul calls the church the Israel of God. So it's about what? It's about Israel. It's about Israel. Now, when we go to Revelation, you read chapter 21 to 22, even though you have not read there. When the Bible is describing the new Jerusalem, that city that descended from heaven onto this earth, it says that it has 12 gates. And these gates were named after the 12 tribes of Israel. So now, if you, the Christian, you, the Gentile Christian, you have not been numbered among the tribe of Israel, which gate will you pass through into the city? Which gate are you going to pass through to that city? It means that every Gentile, now when you are converted to Christ, you are numbered among these tribes of Israel. We are numbered among these tribes of Israel, and that is why we get to enter into that, into the gate. So it's not about, he didn't say that this gate are number are named after uh, assemblies of God or the Gentile churches and denominations. It's named after the 12 tribes of Israel. So the plan is about Israel, not about any denomination. And when we don't get this understanding, then we go on preaching things that some people just appeal because it appealed to their minds. They brought forth these things. But when you read Revelation chapter 22, God warned men of God and preachers, he warned them about the book of Revelation. He warned the church about the book of Revelation, those who bring extra biblical visions and prophecies. He warned them when you read the verse 18 of the chapter 22. 
says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the place that are written in this book. So he tells Christians to be careful. If you don't want to be part of the place, the place of judgment, he says, be careful what you say about this book. Be careful what you preach about this book. You don't add anything which God didn't put in the book of Revelation. So this man of God who will come with extra biblical visions that now God has showed them something different or something in addition to what had been already revealed in the book of Revelation. God says it's not so. He says that this book is enough. This book is enough for the church to understand God's plan. For the church to understand God's plan. So we reach Revelation chapter 19 where we look at the second coming of the Lord where he comes with his holy angels. The Bible says that he comes with all his innumerable angels and Jesus himself attested to that in the gospel of Matthew when he says both in the chapter 16 and the chapter 25 he says I come with all my holy angels. So we look at the Revelation chapter 19 when he says he comes with the armies on white horses. Then in the, at the end of the chapter 19, we find out that when he comes, he will cast the Antichrist and the false prophets into the lake of fire that burns into sulfur and brimstone. He will cast them into these two entities into the lake of fire. So what happens to Satan then? We find out that in the second, in the next chapter, the chapter 20. So now we can move into the chapter 20 where he starts talking about Satan. He says, and I saw an angel come down from heaven. Now there are Christians who think that this Satan is big. There are some Christians who are even afraid of Satan. And it's because of ignorance. First and foremost, every Christian should understand that Satan is a created being. Satan is not God. He was created. The same way in Jamaica was created, the same way Adam was created, Satan was created. All what he has, he has because God put it in him. When you are created, you are a limited being. It means that all what you can do and all what you have is based on what the Creator gave you. You can't go beyond the potentialities of what the Creator gave you. The abilities that the Creator gave you, you can't surpass it. So he himself adds more. So any created being is limited. You can do in accordance to what the Creator put in you. So Satan can do in proportion to the ability that God, the creator Jehovah, placed in Satan. And that is why as a Christian, you don't be afraid of Satan because you go to the creator to understand who this Satan is and how to deal with him. But you also have to understand that Satan also knows about legalities. He is legally minded he knows about spiritual legalities so if you the christian you don't understand spiritual legalities then he will take you for a ride this is the reason why he destroys many christians even including pastors because they lack an understanding of spiritual legalities now here the bible tells us that and i saw an angel come down from heaven not jesus it's not the Lord Jesus who has to come down from heaven to deal with Satan. Since and I saw an angel, not God himself. God sent an angel. And that angel, when the time was, uh, like the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, says that because the time was short, Satan went on with anger and frustration to what? To execute tribulation, to pursue God's children. Because he knew his time was short. But when the time comes, when that 
time of lease, the Adamic lease, comes to an end, and then it is time for God to render judgment on Satan and also bring in his millennial kingdom. Now, this first, there are two forms. The first, uh, in a certain season, the season of the millennium will bind this Satan so that the millennial reign, millennial reign can go on. But even in doing that, he doesn't come down to do that. He just sent an angel. And that angel had enough power to bind Satan. So then I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he lay hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Now, when God gives names to Satan, you should understand. Because the names of Satan helps also you to understand how he functions. He says, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent. He calls Satan an old serpent. Also, he refers him to the devil. Why is he called the devil? He is the devil because he is a slanderer. When he says a devil, he is someone who is a slanderer and also a false accuser. So God is saying here that this Satan, he is a false accuser. He will accuse you falsely if you don't know your identity in Christ. If you don't know your inheritance in Christ, he will accuse you. He will take advantage of that. So he says that he's the devil, he's a false accuser, he's a slanderer. Also, he is called Satan, meaning an opposer, he's an adversary. He is an opposer of, for, of God's purpose and God's act. So if you're a Christian, you think that Satan will just stand still for God's plan and purpose to go on in your life. You are just joking. Whether in ministry, whether in your personal life, always Satan will oppose God's plan for you in that area. And that is why Paul, the apostle, says that fight the good fight of faith. He says fight it. Why fight a fight of faith? Because there's opposition. And in the name of Jesus, you have to fight this fight of faith. So Satan is an opposer. When God in the river Jordan said, talking about the Lord Jesus, says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The Bible says, then was the Lord led of the spirit into the wilderness. And in his temptation, what did Satan say? One of it says that if thou be the son of God, Satan was opposing what God in just a time has just has spoken. God said, Jesus is my beloved son. And Satan came opposing, if thou be the son of God. Why? Because he is a proud figure. Not that he's very powerful, but he's full of pride. So everything that is godliness, he will oppose it. So he said that he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more. So here he helps us to understand who is deceiving the nations, why they are doing what they are doing. All these nations of the world, when they make plans to go to war, they, they fight each other, all those things, the evil, now he says he deceived the nations, both at the national level or individually. He is the one deceiving them. So when you see these nations of the world, they are deceived to be involved in, invent all kinds of evil and wickedness. It's because of the deception of Satan. Also, the individuals in the nations, the Bible, the Bible says the spirit of disobedience works in them. The spirit of error works in them. Who is behind that? It's Satan. So when you find them living the way they are living, like John says, love not the world, not the things of the world, the wisdom of this world. Who is behind the wisdom, wisdom of the world, the fleshly and carnal wisdom of this world? It's Satan who is behind it. That's what God is saying here. So he said that, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. So there is a span of time for the millennium and that time Stands for a thousand years. And that time is what we call the day of the Lord. Now the day of the Lord starts with one day, but actually it's a thousand years. It's a thousand years, but it starts with when it comes 
for the resurrection. But it's a span of thousand years. And the Bible says in that day, only him will be Lord in that day. Only Christ will reign in that day. In that day of the Lord. Meaning that in that millennium reign of the Christ, he only will be God. He only will be Lord, King of Kings. And only his dictates and policies will govern this earth. So it says that Satan will what? Will be bound for a thousand years. So the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loose for a little season. Then John says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Here he tells us that they are beheaded for what? They are testimony of Jesus, not because they were sinners. Like the pre-tribulation raptures, rapture preachers are preaching. They were not beheaded in the tribulation because they were sinners or living anyhow. They were beheaded because for the, the, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So those Christians who will make it in this millennial reign, you will be reigning with the Lord, with the Christ. But John says that by the rest of the dead, live not again. That is why we should preach the gospel to win souls. Because the rest of the dead, live not again until these thousand years were finished. And John says that this is the first resurrection. Also, this is another evidence to those who are preaching a rapture before the tribulation that they are deceiving the church. He says that this is the first resurrection, meaning that before this resurrection, there hadn't been any major resurrection. Now, if you are a preacher or a Christian, you believe in a rapture before the tribulation, what you are saying, you are saying is that there are two major resurrections of God's saints because you are saying that there will be a first major resurrection which will include the church who live godly and then there will be another second major resurrection who, which will include those who are going to be the, in the second flight and also the remnant of the Israelites and the Bible says it's not so it says that this is the first resurrection and in enumerating those who make it in the first resurrection, who are part of the first resurrection, he says that those who were beheaded in the tribulation are part of the first resurrection. So there couldn't be a resurrection before this first resurrection. Because in this first resurrection, the tribulation saints are part of it. Those who have been beheaded in the tribulation. John says, I saw them and they were on thrones. He says that this is the first resurrection. Then it goes and says, Blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection. On such the second death had no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, this is consistent with what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You can even take it from the verse 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 from verse 21. Now these Corinthians had a problem believing in the resurrection. They had a problem believing in the resurrection. Even when you look at the book of Acts, when Paul went to Athens and mentioned, the Bible says that these Athens, they were very superstitious. They were very religious and always they wanted to do a new thing, like Paul put it. Then Paul mentioned about the resurrection of the dead. And when Paul mentioned about the resurrection of the dead, they were so much uh, surprised because they have not heard of something like the dead resurrecting. So they said that you will want to hear more about this matter. So these were people who were very superstitious, they wanted to end, they, had, they, became, they became Christians too, they had a certain misgivings and understanding on the resurrection of the dead. 
So Paul writes this epistle to address those folks who didn't believe, those who were part of them in the church, who didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So this chapter 15, his emphasis on was on resurrection. And he started by telling them that if there isn't any resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not risen at all. And if Christ has not risen at all, then we, the preachers, we are liars because we are saying that God did something that he had not done. Because when you go on preaching the gospel, the gospel is about preaching about the resurrection of Jesus. So if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not risen. And if Christ has not risen, then we are liars, as he put it. But he goes on to say, but Christ really has risen. For the same way in man came death, the same way in a man came resurrection. So it goes on from the verse 19 for instance, it says, For if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But then he goes on, he says, there will be a resurrection, but there is an order. When it comes to this resurrection event, there is an order. He says, but every man in his own order. Then he shows the order. He says, Christ the first fruits, after all they that are Christ at his coming. He doesn't give any additional. Now he is looking at the resurrection as it relates to the church. As to relate to God's people, he doesn't say Christ, then the first, uh, the church, and then the Israelites, the remnant of no. He says Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. That is the order of the resurrection. And this is consistent with what John said. Those who are Christ at his coming are is the first resurrection. Then it goes on to the next verse. It says, Then come at the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. So after he said Christ at his those who are Christ at his coming, he doesn't go on to say that there's a tribulation and after that comes the end. After that, then there's the end. So all those preachers preaching a rapture, two raptures, or two part coming of Jesus, is a lie. It's not scriptural. It's not scriptural. He's coming one. He's coming once. And when he comes one, then all of us, will, those who are alive, will receive the new body. Those who also are dead will be resurrected to get that saved new body. Since that comes at the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put all rule and all authority and power. So when we go back to Revelation chapter 20, Says that by the rest, by the rest of the dead, live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Then he goes and says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death had no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And this is the same one that. Uh, Isaiah was talking about when he says that they will be Levites. Why did he say they will be Levites? Uh, then the prophet didn't have a revelation of the Mechizedic priest, priesthood. So his understanding and knowledge of priesthood reflected his prophecy. Because when God gives you prophecy, like the Bible says that the spirit of prophecy is subject to the one giving the prophecy. So it says that he calls it Levite, but it's the same thing here. It says the priest, but it will be the priest after the order of Melchizedek. It says, Blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection. 
On sight the second death had no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Meaning here, now our, when you say you are a priest, it means that you are everything about your life is devoted and dedicated to God. And that's why even when you become a Christian, you start that kind of life on this earth. Being a priest, like Peter put it, we are built together onto a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. When you are a priest, it means that now that you are a Christian, everything about your life is sanctified and devoted to God. So if you are a Christian, you go on talking about my dreams, my ambitions, and all these things, you are ignorant, you have not understand even what Christianity really is about. Christianity means that now it's no more about you, it's no more about your interest, it's about his interest, it's about his purpose. You exist for him and for his cause and for his plan. That is the true meaning of Christianity. So he says that, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. They shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. When these thousand years are expired, then Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nation which are in the four quarters of the earth, God and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So this battle is different from the battle of Armageddon which we look at in Revelation chapter 19. The battle of Armageddon happens before the millennium reign, before the thousand years of millennium. That's when the battle of Armageddon happens, when the Lord comes and then he fights with the Antichrist and his kingdoms, the nations and those who are with him. But here he talks about another battle which happens it's not really even a battle because of how God defeated them. It's called the battle of God and Magog. This happens after the thousand year, the thousand millennium year of the Lord, reign of the Lord. Then this happens when Satan is loosed. And this battle is also different from what Ezekiel talked about. For Ezekiel in when you look at Ezekiel from the chapter 38 the to the 39, it talks about a battle where Gog, Magog and those who are with Gog will come and attack Israel. That one also is different. Then he used Gog and Magog to represent something different from what John is using here, the usage by John. Now here, John is using Gog and Magog figuratively and is to apply to all those who are in opposition to God. So all those who are in opposition to God on the earth at that time, when Satan is able to deceive them, now they will be, an, they will be like an anti-Christian party. He calls them God and Magog. So the Bible says that Satan will deceive all those. When he's loose, he shall, from the verse 8, he says, shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters, the four corners of the earth, God and Marco, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, meaning that there will be many. There will be many. Because even in this time, in all the thousand years, there will be procreation. Those who will not have the body, those who will not be part of the Christians who will be, get this immortal body, the nations, they will still be here with their mortal body. And at that time, they will not die. They will not die. So in this whole millennium year, they will be marrying, they will be giving birth, and they will increase in number. They also, some also now will be living very long because at that time, no death. So the Bible says that to gather them together to the battle, the number of whom is as the sun of the sea. So there will be so many. There will be so many. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints, the encampment of the saints about, and the beloved city. And the Bible says that when the, 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 the Satan deceived them to go with him to attack the saints, the Bible says that fire came down from God out of heaven 
and devoured them. Fire came from God out of heaven and devoured them. Then he goes on, he says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. So this is where in time then Satan will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And this is why it's important for Christians. Last time at the Bible study when Brother Chris uh, raised a question about death, I was trying to explain, but he did not get it really. We have to understand death, how God sees death, from how man sees death. Now here he talks about the second death. And the second death, this Antichrist, this Antichrist will be a man. Satan is cast into the lake of fire. The false prophet was a man. Just that the Antichrist was possessed to do all what he did. But the Bible says that they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. They will be existing. They will not go out of existence. Nothing that God created. No creature of God, uh, not animals is different, but when it comes to spirits, go out of existence. Man which, which were created after the image of God, there's nothing like going out of existence. You will still be in existence, but it's dead because you are going to suffer endlessly throughout eternity. And that is what God sees as death. Man, when man talks about death, he thinks that when you, you, are, you are out of existence. No. It's suffering. You are going to suffer and suffer and suffer forever because God is life. And when you are not with life, you get damnation. So it's a curse. It's a damnation. You go to where those who are damned are supposed to be. And you shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. There is no end to it. It is not 1,000 years, 2,000 years, 1 billion years, or 1 trillion years, or zillion years. This is forever and ever. So you are going to be tormented forever and ever. Now, in Matthew chapter 22, in Matthew chapter 22, the Sadducees came to Jesus. These Sadducees were a sect who also did not believe in the resurrection. And why did not, didn't they believe in the resurrection? Because Paul, in, his, in the book of Acts, Luke helps us to understand that these Sadducees, they did not believe in the existence of spirits and also of the resurrection. They didn't believe that man was a spirit. They didn't believe that. So when in Matthew chapter 22, they came to the Lord Jesus. He knew the people that he was dealing with. He said that the same day came to him the Sadducees, which said that there is no resurrection, asked him. So he knew these people, who they were, this sect that he was dealing with. He knew them. The Lord had a foreknowledge of them that they did not know that there was a spirit. Neither did they also believe in the resurrection. So he said that they came saying to him, Master, Moses said, if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Because in the law of Moses, in the Mosaic law, this was the instruction God gave to them. So then they now were going to use this to tempt Jesus. So they went on to say, now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased. And having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Then they went on. He says that likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, if you are saying there is a resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seventh? For they all had her. Then the master in his response, the Bible says that Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err uh, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. The same way there are some churches and denominations erring because they have a lack of understanding of the scriptures. Jesus, the Lord is saying that when you don't know the scriptures, you will be in error. When you don't understand the scriptures, you will be in error. Say so you do err uh, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So if you want to understand the scriptures, if you want to know truth, 
we should go to the scriptures. Like Paul said to Timothy, all scriptures are inspired of God and has been given to us for teaching, for doctrine, and for instruction. See, that has been given to us for proof, for proof, and for what? For instruction, for training in righteousness. That is what the scriptures have been given to us for. So Jesus said, you do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So God's word is the most important. The scriptures are the most important. There's nothing in the life of the Christian which is greater and important than the scriptures. The most important thing in our life as Christians is the word of God. So here the master said, you do err because you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. Please, next verse. For in the resurrection, they neither marry. So those who have been preaching that Christians, when they are resurrected, will be marrying, they are lying to them. There are some people who, who preach such messages. It's ignorance. No Christian after the resurrection is going to marry. There isn't any marriage, husband and wife, in, 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 in the resurrection because we all look like man. The body that we all receive is the body of, like, of a man. There will be any gender. There will be any woman. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So the Lord is saying the same way there's no gender when it comes to the angels, it's the same way. Now, there are certain angels who are able to take the form of men. And that's why uh, in, during the time of Enoch, some of them were able to procreate with, with women, the daughters of Adam, the daughters of Noah. But then, in that angelic state, there isn't any gender. So that, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read? So Jesus said, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by, by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead but of the living. So what was Jesus saying here? Now, these folks came to Jesus with a question on resurrection because they didn't believe that there was a spirit. They didn't believe that man is a spirit. Man is very important if you're a Christian to understand that you are not a body. You are a spirit. You are a spirit being made up of the spirit and the soul. The body is just the house that God gave you. To you to live and function on the earth. You are not the body. And that is why Peter will call the body a tabernacle. Paul too will call it a dwelling place or a house. That is what the body is. But the true man is encased in that body. But here the Lord said, I, God has been telling you all these times, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Because even after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, any time God will come to the Israelites, God didn't say, I was the God of Abraham. God will always put it in the present. I am the God of Abraham. Throughout all their history, that's how God will introduce himself. At that time, Abraham was not living on this earth. Abraham was dead, Isaac was dead, Jacob was dead. They were not existing on this earth. But God was still saying, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. So the master says that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So what was he trying to tell the Sadducees at this point in time? He was trying to tell them that Abraham is still living. You think that Abraham is dead, he's, he's not existing. Because they thought that if man dies, that is all. But the Lord Jesus said, no, Abraham is still existing. I have, God has a bigger universe and with different departments and different places. You are on earth, but there's another place where spiritual men to live. So he says that don't think that Abraham is dead. Ask in how you think that. Abraham is still living. He's still existing. God is not the God of the dead, but it's of the living. No wonder when you read Luke chapter 16, when he was given that story of Lazarus and the rich man, he said that when they died, they went into what? The waiting room, the Abraham's bosom. And they had a communication with Abraham. They had a communication with Abraham. 
So Abraham really was existent. It was consistent with everything Jesus said, both in Luke chapter 16 and here, that Abraham was still living, still existent. So when what man will call his car dead, is just the true man coming out of his house and going to another part. But when God really says dead, what he's trying to say is that you are going to suffer. When God says dead, it's not just you coming out of your body. Your, that's why on Tuesday I was saying that Jesus had to suffer. Why is it that Jesus, God has said, Jesus, just come out of your body and then you'll pay? No. For him to pay for the wages of sin, he had to suffer. That's why he went through all what he went through. The Bible says that on the cross, his visage was so mad that he didn't resemble a human being. Without that suffering, there wouldn't have been any payment. The payment was not just Jesus coming out of his body, but what was going to lead to that was very also very important. So we have to see death as how God sees death, not as how man defines death in his dictionary. You have got man, the, all the things they define, whether love, faith, or dictionary, is governed by their wisdom, the wisdom that they have been taught over the years. But that is not true wisdom. True wisdom is the word of God, God's mind. God knows everything. So what he reveals in his word is the truth, not what man says. Man is just learning, but God knows everything. So you see that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So when we come back to Revelation chapter 20, what it says is that they suffer, the second death, they suffer forever and ever and ever. That is death. That is death. They are, that is, that is, they, are, they are suffering, being tormented. And that is why you, the Christian, you, sh you shouldn't go, depart through sickness and all those evil way of suffering. The only suffering a Christian when you depart is okay, it's been a matter that when you are dying for uh, godly purposes and that gives glory to God. So Paul says that whether I live or die, that God, that Christ be magnified in my body. So how did he die? He died as a matter and God was magnified. The same way Peter died as a matter and God was magnified. Apart from those kind of death, all the other death from sicknesses, from cancer and all those things is not for the Christian. Those ones are a case. Those ones are a case. And that is how God sees it. Please let's look at something in Revelation chapter 22. Many times when you say some of these things, there are Christians who have a problem with that. But these are not the words of man or us. If these are the words that God sends us to preach and teach because these are the truth in his word. When you read Revelation chapter 22 from verse 1, he says, And he showed me a pure river. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life which bear twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Then he goes on, and there shall be no more curse. God himself is speaking, and he says that, and there shall be no more curse. So what is God calling a curse? That is what Christians should ask themselves and their preachers. That here, what is God calling a curse? God says that at this time there is no more curse. So now that we have not reached this time, at this point in time, for with the restoration of all things, God says that there is a curse on this earth. So if you are a Christian, what you ask yourself is, what is God calling a curse? What is God here calling a curse? Now, when you read the verse. Two, before he came here, he gives you an indication of what he's saying. He's saying, and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, and yielded her, her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Were for the healing of the nations. Then it goes on, and there shall be no more curse. Sickness, God is telling that sickness and disease is a curse. That is what God is telling man. So when they plead that, oh, I'm sick, as God's plan, 
you, it's not God's plan. God is saying that it's not my plan, it's a curse. I never created man to be sick. That's what God is saying here. And that is why this is consistent too with Deuteronomy chapter 28. When he was enumerating the curses of the law, he includes sicknesses. So all the things that we not find in the next age to come, they are what? Curse. Because, like Peter said, we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwell in. So in that new earth and in that new heaven, that coming down, righteousness only will dwell. You will not see sickness. You will not see death. You will not see all that stop the sorrows and the pains of man. So all these shows, all these pains, all these things that are going on, God says, it's a curse. It's a curse. It's not something that it was God who planned it or, or it was part of God's plan for, the, for mankind. It's a curse. Now, if you're a Christian, you are not part of the curse anymore. Or if you are putting Galatians to the thing that Christ has redeemed us from the curse. Now, if you say Christ has redeemed you from the curse and you understand what is the curse, why are you accepting that for yourself? And that is why Jesus himself in Mark 16 says that those who believe in me, these signs shall follow them. Those who do not believe, they will be damned. Why? They will be cursed. And then he let you know because they believe in me and they will not be part of the curse, the things that they are not supposed to go through anymore. What did he say? They shall lay their hands on the sick. And the state shall be healed. Why? Because he, sickness is a care. So, and then it's not for the Christian anymore. He said that they are better by serpents. Serpents should not be able to harm them. Why? Because deadly things, poisonous things, harming a person is on a case. Because when Adam sinned, there was a case that came upon this earth. So when headache comes to man, what you do is that you see the way God sees it and you stand against it. You stand against it. You stand against it knowing that it is not for you. We stand against it. And these are the truths that God revealed to us. So, Paul, for instance, in Hebrew chapter 6, who says that those who mature, spiritually mature, they will then be partakers of the powers of the age to come. These are those who understand these important truths. But those Christians who will be, still be carnal and will believe in the wisdom of this world, they will what? Be casualties to all these things. But God says that, no, stand against them. Fight the good fight of faith because it's not for you. When you come into Christ, there should be no more cares for you. There should be no more cares for you. So we thank the Lord for today's message. We thank the Lord for today's message. That as a Christian, what you have to understand is that Jesus is coming. Gone were the days where we say Jesus is coming and then it was just his coming. We know he will come, he will come. No, Jesus really is coming. Jesus really is coming and he's so near. In about a decade, the Lord is coming. These are facts. This is not something that someone is trying to just preach to make someone happy. This is what the word of God shows. You see, we can date from Adam to where we are and you know that Jesus is coming. You can look at the chronology. You can look at the timeline and you know that Jesus really is coming. Because all these secrets, all these clues, they are in the Bible. They are in the Word. And even that one is, it can also be a, a series on its own. But they are in the Word. In his first coming, Jesus it was there. The first coming of Jesus was already there before he came. In Daniel chapter 9, God has revealed to Jeremiah and Daniel when the, the, the coming, the cross, the coming of Jesus, the Messiah should be. Those Pharisees were not serious. If they were serious and they would have gone to the, 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 the Torah and also look at what has been stated in the word and ask themselves, the time span given to us, are we living in that time span? In that season, sorry. And they would have known that in this season that we are is when the Messiah is supposed to come. Then they would have known that Jesus is the Messiah. But because they were not serious, they didn't take cognizance of the word of God and they missed it. But when you read the Gospels, there were some people who knew. 
The Bible talks about Simeon. It talks about the prophetess Anna. They knew that the Messiah was supposed to come around that time. So they were in their life. Even Simeon says that God told him that he should see the, the face of the Messiah before he, he passed on. And when he saw the Messiah, he was what? He was okay and he praised the Lord. So they knew. In the first time, there were some who knew that he was coming. The question asked, so the, why the three wise men? Those wise men, right? We don't know whether they are three or more, but let's say they are three because of the present, but the Bible doesn't say they are three. But the wise men who came to, to Jesus, how did they know? How did they know that the star was the star of the Messiah? How did they know? So there were people at that time who knew about the first coming. It's the same for the second coming. The clues are there, but it's not on the surface. You have to search it out. The Bible says that the works of God are great. Set out of by those who take pleasures in them. So as for God, He will put it inside, but you have to search it out, and through the Holy Spirit, you will know that these things are there. And when you date it, you know that Jesus is coming. In about 10, 11, that yes, about he is coming. From now, the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. So if you are a Christian, then the question you ask yourself, how do I want to live my life? How do I want to live my life? All these things that we do in this world, they are nice. We went to school, they are nice. We go, we go to work, they are nice. All these things, like Paul says, they are passing away very soon with this earth. They are passing away. We have families, they are nice. Husband and wife, they are nice. For all these things, they are passing away. You have sisters, siblings, mother, father, they are nice. But all these things are passing away very soon. But when the master comes, he is not going to ask us, he is not going to ask us, were you able to go to school? He's not going to ask you, did you get a BSc or a master's degree or did you do a PhD? He's not going to ask you those things. He's not going to ask you, did you give birth to children? He's not going to ask us about these things. He's going to ask like Mark said he's, in his gospel. He's going to ask just one thing. The work that I gave you people with regards pertaining to my kingdom, did you do it? Did you do it? All the channels, all the resources, these are opportunities. These are opportunities to take advantage of. Why do you, the, 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 does God want the student to be educated? Because you need that a time will come that if you are not educated, you cannot what, preach the gospel, evangelize the world. Look at now, where we find ourselves. People who are not enlightened to understand computer, how will they be effective in evangelizing? So you know that your students have to be educated if they can really carry out his work. But everything that he put in our hands is for solely, first and primarily, for the purpose of the kingdom. Don't let anyone deceive you. And also, don't be deceived and influenced by those kind of Christians who that all what they think about. If you are a Christian and you are 80% of the time, you are talking about the things of this world, how to make money and advance about the things of this world. You should not be associated with such people. 80, if 80% 80 of their time, or even 50%, that's all what they think about. They are kana. These are for kana Christians. Kana Christians think like that. Spiritually mature Christians will spend about just 5% or 10% of their time thinking about the things of this world. 90% is about the kingdom. It's about the things of God. Because spiritual maturity will let you know why you are here. When you are spiritually mature, you are, you are, there's agency in your spirit. Because you know the plan, you know the purpose, and you know that the kingdom is coming. You know that the master is coming, and things ought to be done before he comes. You know that the way, there's so much to be done. There are people to save. So you are thinking, every time you are thinking about what to do, what should I do, to what? To, to, to further the cause of the kingdom. That's all what it's about. That is all what it's about. So let us be continue to be motivated and encouraged to even do more for the Lord and think of ways 
to, to do more and expand the kingdom. That is what is important. There are certain Christians who think that, oh, because I go to church, it's okay. Because I am a worship leader in the church. I am a secretary in the church. I am an usher in the church. All those things are nice. They are wrong for all those things. But that's the primary reason why we are here. The church is for a purpose. Like Paul put it in Ephesians chapter 4. He gave the fivefold ministry to equip. The church equips the Christian for the work of the ministry. What ministry was he talking about? The ministry of reconciliation. That God has given to every Christian. And you, you the Christian, you are here today. Those online. Those in other churches. You have a ministry. You are a minister. And the ministry that he has given you is the ministry of reconciliation. For instance, in Light Embassy, God has given us so many messages, many devotions. Every time you are receiving materials every day. How have you been using that material to further your ministry of reconciliation? Or you just receive it and then you are okay? How have you been using this material? The materials come from the Lord. Every day you have been receiving this material. How many people do you send these materials to to bless? You have a lot of uh, WhatsApp contacts. Every time you are talking with them, Mr. Abenta, every time I see you talking with them, how many times do you send the devotion to them, Mr. Joy? How many times do you do that? How many times? All these things are important. All these things, when you do that, you are carrying out your ministry of reconciliation. It doesn't necessarily mean that a message should come from you, but you can take advantage of the message to fulfill your ministry of reconciliation. You will do that, and when it comes, you are doing that. But you have to first understand that you have a ministry. And when it comes, the question is going to assess us by that ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. And it's for every Christian. It's very important. It's very important. In some churches, they have not been taught this important truth. So they are there, they think that, oh, because I go to church every Sunday, I am what? Doing what God wants me to do. That's how they think. But that's not why we are here. The Bible says that when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, we are building up Zion with the Lord. And this is why we are here. This is why we are here. Many years ago, why did, did uh, uh, Christianity come to Africa? These were me, Christians. These were not even five-four ministers. Of course, there are some five-four ministers, but most of them were even everyday Christians, missionaries, who left everything that they were doing in their countries because when they got an understanding of Christianity and their purpose in this world, they said no. Some of them, they left everything and they went to the nations of this world. They had, they had children, they had wives, they had husbands, they had mothers, they had fathers, they had social relations, but they left everything and they went to Africa, to Asia, to America, preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is where the gospel reached where it wasn't. We are going to this same kingdom with all these folks. They are folks who gave their life so that you may get the Bible in the dark ages. Some people gave their life to make all these things possible. What are we doing? What are we doing? What will be our story when the Lord comes? Because in that kingdom, there will be a lot of people, a lot of saints. Those in the Old Testament, those in the New Testament, those who are the, from the first century to the 21st century, they will all be there. And some have done so many for God. There are some who were killed, burnt, because of the gospel. Because of the gospel. What are we doing for the gospel? What are we doing for the gospel? So the question you have to ask yourself, if you have to ask yourself, if you, yes, Friday, Brother Ben was sharing with me, something that he has taught, 
that we can do to what? advance evangelism. What does that mean? It means that when he's there, he's thinking about the work, the ministry that has been given to him on what? On earth. So he's thinking about how can we advance? How can we use this material, this devotion, this material to what? To advance the cause. That's what should take most of our thinking. When you are there, you think about this my these devotions. Every day God is sending us him a message. How can we use it to win souls in Lund, Cluster Garden, and all over? You can you, and then you think about this. God will bring you ideas. You bring your idea, I bring my idea, you all bring ideas. Then you are we advance the kingdom. That is what is important. That is what is important. Some people may look at you and you will be laughing at you. They will some look at you and say, oh, this person is not serious. Oh, this person, he is a professor in the university teaching. But he said, I need to focus on the teaching. He's rather going on what? About the things of God. This lady, she is doing a PhD. What? In the university. He's not going to focus on the PhD. He's going about with the things of what? Of God. This lady, he's doing masters. But instead of her to focus, he is going about with the things of God. People will see us a fool. What should be important to you is how does God see you? Don't think that you wake up to tomorrow and the world will change their life, their, 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 their mentality. They will think you are, they will think us as a fool. They will think that we are wasting our time. But you know that when God looks down and sees you, he will say that my daughter, my children. These are children of wisdom, wise children. That is what you have to consider. The most important thing is how God sees me. How God sees me, not how man sees me. If you focus on man and their value system, you will not be happy because they will not change their mind. How they measure success will never change. But measure success by how God measures success. Jesus said, the life of a man consisted not in the abundance of things. He says, there's not a thing that we accumulate, whether we accumulate degrees, whether we accumulate money, whether we accumulate properties. We are good, but that's not how he measures us. So then we have to find out how he measures us so that you do much of this. He says, build your treasures in heaven. This is very important. So we thank the Lord. The Lord bless you in everything that you do this week. In your careers, at your workplace. May the grace of God abound in your life. You see, may the grace of God abound in your life. Once you, you are doing what you are doing, keep on doing it. You see that any time, anywhere you reach, in your walk in Christ, the grace will be made available to continue. The grace will be made available to continue. So we thank the Lord for the message. Amen.